Today we are talking about the Synod in Rome. Um, the Catholic bishops and priests and uh, lay men and women from all over the world are gathering for the Synod of Bishops to discuss synodality, um, the church and its mission. It's part of a three-year process initiated by the Pope and apparently all 1.3 billion Catholics in the world have been invited to contribute. There are two Synod meetings of bishops in Rome, one begins next week and the second is in a year's time. The Synod is running from the 4th to the 29th of October, but before that, over this weekend, there's an ecumenical gathering, um, a four-day prayer vigil in St Peter's Square in Rome. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury is going to be among those there. And that suggests that for the Pope and for those attending, this is more than about even just the Catholic Church. Um, I'm really grateful to all our expert guests who've joined us for this discussion, to everyone who's taken the time to listen to what they have to say, and I hope to add your comments and questions a little later on. Um, put any questions and comments in the chat box. I might read them out, but also I might come to you. So if you, if you really don't want me to come to you, then just indicate that and, uh, and, and I won't. Um, I'm going to introduce our guests as I go. As I say, they're all pretty expert and, and a plea to them really to um, spell out the acronyms, not assume we all know um, what different things are. And Christopher Lamb, you are um, a writer for the tablet. And I don't think we should assume we know in the Catholic context what a synod is, because it means different things in different churches. So just start briefly by telling me what is a, a synod? Well, synods obviously are an ancient concept in the church and <laughs> go back to the uh, Acts of the Apostles, the first synod, the, being the Council of Jerusalem. So synods in the Catholic understanding in the most more recent times have been a gathering uh, of bishops to discuss important topics. Um, but what Francis has done in his pontificate is take the ancient concept of the synod and repurpose it for the 21st century. So building on the tradition of synodality that has existed in the church, but has uh, to his mind, fallen away, particularly in the West, and repurpose it for the contemporary era. And his idea of the synod is not just about the meeting, although that's important in Rome, but a culture of synodality in the church at every level. So bringing together everyone in the church, people, priests, bishops, cardinals, and yes, also the Pope, to listen to each other and articulate the mission of the church in the contemporary era. I'm afraid um, the phrase uh, a synod on a synodality rather makes me want to go and lie down in a dark room. Um, but but synodality is is about the participation, the way of being church. Am I am I right? Is that what That's we right. understand by it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And it's an awkward word. I agree with that. Um, but I think the synods are going to be the signature reform of this pontificate and one that's likely to outlast him. Right, okay. Now tell us what's break groundbreaking about this particular synod. Well, first of all, I think it's the consultation that has taken place. Uh, you mentioned it in your intro. All of the church was asked to participate. So it, it made the synod process, which began with local synodal dialogues in different parishes and dioceses, the largest listening exercise in human history. Uh, so this is a, what is new um, in the uh, in the Francis era is this uh, consultation and listening to the people, uh, to all Catholics. And obviously the other thing that is new is, is um, not just listening, but the greater participation of lay people. So in this synod, women will be voting for the first time as, as delegates and there will be a much broader representation of the church at the synod so it's it is a synod of bishops technically but it is also including um lay people religious different different um representatives in the church what will they be voting on because we're told that this isn't going to sort of you know change ch church doctrine or anything so what what might they be voting on i don't think the voting is the most important thing at this stage what is from what we can see what is happening is uh, they're trying to create this culture of synodal listening. A lot of being made of the fact that they, they are going to be voting members. So I yeah, mean there will be a vote. Um we don't it, it may well take place at the end of this synod assembly, but it will certainly take place in 2024. They'll be voting on uh 
the discussions that have taken place over a series of uh, over a series of topics uh, contained in the working document for the synod, which is sets out a series of questions, and this is all based on the dialogues that have taken place. So they're going to be looking at the big question of clericalism, the abuse of power, they're looking at the role of women, they're looking at issues of migration, climate change, all the big issues that have that have arisen through the dialogues. So they're going to be discussing those and then they will be agreeing and voting on a document, uh, well, a synthesis of the discussions at the end of this uh, three-week gathering. And then there'll be a, I presume, another document at the end of the October 2024 gathering. So they will be voting on what they have discussed, discerned, and I presume and I expect that whatever is voted on will then be sent back to the local churches for further discussion and discernment. Now, there's an awful lot of talk about this. Some people are saying, you know, this is the biggest thing since Vatican II. Some people are saying this is another reformation. It's about the future of Christianity and not just Catholicism. Um, can you, how much of this is hyperbole and how much of this do you think really is the case? Well, I think the Synod has great potential for those things. Um, and the ecumenical element that you emphasised at the beginning is 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 vital because this is about the Catholic Church, not just listening to one another, but listening to other uh, Christian churches and traditions, uh, particularly those traditions that have a more developed idea of the Synod or, or of synodality. Uh, so I think there's great potential for that. Um, and I would recommend the, the Thomas Halleck reflection to the Lutheran World Assembly, Father Thomas Halleck, a Czech priest, who recently reflected on the Synod and what that what potential it has to um, be a, a, a very inclusive moment for all Christians. But I, I think we should also emphasise the context for where this synod is coming from. There is clearly a big need for reform and renewal in the Catholic Church. We've had the abuse scandals uh, that have really devastated uh, Catholics. Those have exposed the deep need for reform, not just uh, to, to tackle the, the problem of abuse, but to deal with the underlying abuses of power that led to them. And of course, the church is in a new era. We are facing unprecedented crises, the climate change, uh, catastrophes, the uh, migrants crisis. So the church can't simply continue um, as business as usual. And I think that is what is behind a lot of the, the, the synodal renewal. That is what I think is driving Francis. Thank you. We'll come back to you, I'm sure, Christopher, but I'm going to turn now to Professor Anna Rowlands, who's Professor of Catholic Social Thought and Practice at University of Durham, but she has been working with the General Secretariat of the Synod, and she has seen the fruits of this enormous consultation. And I understand you've not been sleeping and you've read most of them. Um, so, um, Anna, 103 billion Catholics, I mean, I, I'm not going to ask you how many have been engaged but i mean you know i will ask you how far has the reach of this consultation gone what's been the, the nature of the engagement one of the first things to say is that the ambition of the consultation was exactly as chris has said which was that the pope wanted every single catholic and anybody who felt that they had a sense of belonging connection to the catholic community to feel that they could contribute the reality is that that invitation went out in a pandemic it went out into a church that's struggling with various uh, challenges in terms of engaging its laity and also in terms of the challenges, interestingly, of bishops and priests feeling that they can speak openly and freely in their own right too. So the reality is that was a genuinely universal call for consultation. What comes back to us is in, in effect a representation of the reality of where we are as a church right now, which is that in some context, the invitation to engage was taken up with huge enthusiasm, huge creativity, and actually some of the most, some of the richest and most impressive uh, reports that came into us, that gave us the, the best kind of data and reflections came from contexts in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, where there was a really vibrant engagement with those themes. And, and the messages that come out from those contexts are, a real desire to have a vibrant, 
uh, participatory church, one in which there is increased transparency, better participation, more involvement in the governance and structures of the church itself, but where the church itself is actually more capable in this generation of reaching out to accompany its own laity, so that particularly family groups, younger people, people with disabilities, women who feel that the realities of their own lives are quite disconnected from much of what they hear in church, all of those voices are there in a global context. Do you um, detect a, a difference between the concerns coming from the global north and the global south, which one might anticipate? Yeah, so interestingly, this is one of the things that people said to me before I read the reports. They said, it's really obvious what you're going to find. You're going to find a church that's divided between global north and global south. So that basically you've got the Swiss and the Germans who, who are all about kind of identity uh, issues. And then you've got the global south, which is absolutely dead set against those issues and has a whole series of other things that it's concerned about. That is simply not how the reports read. So the reports read with a really striking correspondence in issues that face the Catholic Church at the most local level globally. And they are things like liturgy that actually engages people, preaching that isn't either too hurriedly prepared, judgmental or completely impenetrable um, and academic and abstract. It's about women feeling that they have a place in the church which is not merely a kind of service role but which fully uses their charism so that they participate fully it's issues about transparency about abuse about accountability but most of it is a desire in a very complex demanding world that we live in to have a church which feels like a positive beautiful place to belong and make a meaningful difference i was struck by the submission for from the Irish Catholics who say they want better prepared, shorter sermons and fewer bloodthirsty readings from the Old Testament. I think uh, I'll say amen to that one. Um, but um, I'm just wondering to what extent you heard from Catholics who are actually um, opposed to the Synod process altogether? Yeah, so we absolutely did. Um, many people made individual submissions. So the Synod Office received individual letters, they received submissions from very particular groups from all around the world, and every single one of those was read, despite the kind of accusations that all of that would be ignored. So there are those who feel very strongly that either their voices, we might call those on the ecclesial margins, they feel their voices are not really welcome. And there are two ver versions of that. One is um, a group who would be who would see themselves or self-label as as traditionalists, who maybe, for example, might attend Latin Mass, etc., and they feel that this is um, a, a deeply dangerous process and also one from which they are their voices are excluded from. Now that isn't a completely homogenous group, and I shouldn't present it as such, but that's one grouping who obviously did write individual submissions. Another group of those who feel perhaps at the other more progressive end of the of the spectrum, and I, I don't really like either categorization, but for the sake of shorthand. And um, that they feel that the synod process that they've been consulted endlessly before and nothing will really change. And they worry that there'll be a kind of constant watering down process from the kind of liveliness of what's there at the grassroots, the kind of visceral honesty of that and that it will be watered down as it goes up through the process, which is one of the reasons why what Chris said a moment ago is really important, that this is meant to be a circular motion, so that it isn't something that just starts with the grass reaps and goes higher and higher and higher, but rather at each stage there is a circling back to the grass reaps, um, and that the whole process ought, if it's working properly, to be, to be circular in that way. It's not just a mass consultation for the Pope to contemplate at his desk. It's meant to be a, a kind of enlivening of the church to learn to be and do. So what matters most is, is getting people experienced in the process of being church in this way. That's what the Pope wants. Thank you. Um, Martin Pendergast, you're the um, co-founder of the LGBT plus Catholics Westminster and chair of the Global Network of Rainbow Catholics Theology Committee. Um, two questions for you, really. I mean, I mean one, if you could just summarise um, what your um, constituency are saying to the Synod and, and secondly, whether you have confidence in its, its processes. Thank you, Rosie, and um, uh, good to hear from Anna and, and Chris as well. Um, I think our main uh, element in our submissions has been uh, to address the question in the Synod's working document that, uh, that Chris referred to. Um, there's a question there that asks how the church can um, create uh, space for LGBT Catholics. Um, and we'd rather like to turn that question upside down and say, um, 
that's not the real question. Uh, the real question is, how can the spaces that we have created for ourselves, spaces of faith and celebration and commitment and work for justice uh, in all sorts of areas, how can those spaces be respected and valued as contributing to the church's uh, communion, participation uh, and mission? And at the same time, uh, we also uh, call for um, uh, further consideration further consideration of elements of the church's teaching which so many have found unacceptable um including even cardinals um very involved in the synod process um that so much of our current teaching on sexual orientation and gender identity uh really is quite faulty based and we need to honestly recognize that and without getting into, as Anna was uh, saying, not getting into a referendum on church teaching, nevertheless, we need to have uh, an honest recognition uh, of the uh, lack of uh, reception of the church's teaching in areas of sexual orientation and gender identity, not just by LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, Catholics themselves, but by our parents and families, all of whom are committed members of the church. What about representation? I mean, the, there's, I, I don't think there's any self-affirming LGBT um, um, delegate or voting delegate um, at the Synod. Um, so your voice has got to cut through these consultations, hasn't it? I mean, what, what do you feel about the representation generally? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're very disappointed uh, that uh, there is no self-affirming uh, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual or trans uh, voting delegate in the Synod. Um, and at the same time, we're, we're rather appalled um, that uh, someone from uh, a Pentecostal leader from Ghana has been invited as a, a fraternal ecumenical uh, participant when he's well known for his uh, very strong opposition to the decriminalization of homosexuality, not only in Ghana, but in other African countries as well. And that's not in line with the stance that Pope Francis has taken uh, on the issue. Thank you. Um, Miriam uh, Dignan, um, you're from the Wiengaard Institute for Catholic Research, which um, is, I'm told, represents a forum for reform in the Catholic Church. Um, what's some um, how how are you um, positioning yourself in relation to Synod? What are your members and the people that you reach out to? How are they engaging in the process and what are their hopes for it? Thanks, Rosie. Yes, I'm representing the Weingarts Institute of Catholic Research. I'm also part of Women's Ordination Worldwide. And um, I was asked to speak on this panel actually on behalf of Spirit Unbounded, um, of which all of these groups um, are, are a member. We're all participating. And that is a lay-led Synod that is happening on October the 13th and the 14th in Rome and in Bristol. So I'm really speaking on behalf of all of the reform groups, which is over 40 Catholic reform groups who are participating in Spirit Unbounded. And we, the reason we are having this um, sort of alternative lay-led synod is really to bring together all those voices for reform and make sure that those who have never had a voice in the official Catholic Church's teaching and policymaking and synodal process are heard and it will be an open forum open to the public that is really running you know in a very different way to the slightly secretive closed door synodal process that ordinary catholics can't really um participate in beyond the the listening sessions and the the discussions that happened ahead of time so it's really to bring uh a voice to the marginalized groups who want the bishops to listen to their genuine concerns but uh, but can i ask you have, have you have those the groups that you you're engaged with have they been participating in the consultations that have yes. been taking place yes absolutely the wine guards institute uh, as an example has written a constitution for the catholic church a proposed constitution that has been co-authored by many catholic theologians and signed by hundreds of supporters, and that was uh, hand-delivered by myself to the Synod office and um, entered into those documents and all of the reform groups that are part participating in Spirit Unbounded, including Women's Ordination Worldwide. We have written letters, we've written um, our you know, opinions to the Synod of Bishops, 
and conducted our own listening sessions and gathered together all of the voices that, that need to be heard and submitted those. So we have taken a very active part in the synodal process. And, and can I ask you really briefly, but perhaps what, what encourages you most about um, the, the fact that synod's taking place and the process and what concerns you most? Mm -hmm. Well, what's wonderful about the synod is that it has the, the working document, the Instrumentum Laboris, has posed a lot of questions for dis discernment and discussion within that synod hall. And there's no foregone conclusions. And it mentions the question of women, women's ordination, women's ministries, quite a bit, not, not enough. And it's slightly watered down. But, but the fact is, as Anna said, the grassroots voices that came up, the, the, the emerging um, contributions from all parts of the world, it wasn't split north and south as people anticipated. Everyone is talking about women's ministry, either the diaconate, priesthood or all ministries. And we know that it's a question that can no longer be ignored because having had such strong contributions and the mention of women coming so often, I think that bishops can't really go home empty handed. This can't be another exercise in kicking the can down the road. The question of women's equal involvement is, is it's sort of the toothpaste is out of the tube and it's not going back in. So that's our hope for the Synod. But then of course, as, as, as all of your speakers so far have mentioned, there is a strong opposition to the question being raised of women's ordination. And there are those who are saying that doctrine cannot change, that canon law cannot change. And that simply isn't true. Pope right. Francis himself has said that doctrine has to grow and it has to change. And canon law can and has been changed to reflect the modern times and the will of the people, the, the voice of the faithful. Thank you. Uh, that's a good uh, moment for me to bring in Sister Professor Jill Golding, who's a member of the Theological Commission for the Secretariat. So um, I don't know, Sister, whether you can tell us whether um, doctrine can change or how theology, um, what theology underpins uh, the process that is happening and the changes that may come out of it. Uh, thank you. You don't ask simple questions. <laughs> First of all, I think what's most important to have a feel for, and it's something that Pope Francis often makes the point, that the protagonist of the synodal process is the Holy Spirit. So in a sense, what he's looking to in saying that is that all of us, um, if we are open, can, as it were, perceive something of where the spirit is working. That's what the point of the listening section were. People came together to reflect on the word of God and then, as it were, to raise up what they felt was, was being made manifest to them in their heart. They didn't come to lobby for any agenda. They came to actually exchange in depth. And that, in, that really is the foundational movement um, that's underpinning the synodal process, which in itself is not just something that he sees as has been said already, um, occurring within the assembly, but as it were, in the locality. So the Instrumentum Laboris itself is not just a document for the assembly. Francis made it quite clear that it's also a document for the localities, for, in, for people in the pews, for anybody. And I keep putting this forward in various um, talks and presentations I'll give, to be engaged with that we are all reflecting upon that. In terms of um, a change of doctrine, I don't think that's the primary focus for um, at, at all for Pope Francis or indeed for the reality of what's occurring. It's primarily to raise up the fact that the people of God all have voice. Um, and that means that whether people are lay people, religious, priests, bishops, whatever, we have something to learn from them. And that, in a sense, is the primary focus because the synod, synodal process, which is so often termed walking together, is actually a process that, um, by its very nature, raises up the baptismal dignity of every. Uh, baptized uh, Christian, 
but also to the essential dignity of every human person made in the image and likeness of God, given the gift of life. And therefore, even through that, has a worth that's, that is important to be heard, listened to, whether you're on one polarised extreme or another, mm. as it were. Thank you very much. Um, Catherine Pepinster, um, journalist and author, um, I don't know what reflections you've got to offer at this point, but I mean, I suppose one obvious question is, um, Christopher mentioned at the start that this might be Francis's, you know, biggest legacy. But I mean, uh, uh, what does a truly synodal church mean for the primacy of the Pope? Well, I think that's a very good question. Um, if I could just start from somewhere else. I, I love coming on sessions like this and hearing from people like Miriam and Martin, because they have very strong views. There's a great deal of clarity in what, what they say. But they're, they're, they're effectively activists. They're not, they're not the ordinary Catholic in the pew. And I think the problem for the Catholic Church is not the ordinary Catholic even in the pew. It's the ordinary Catholic who isn't in the pew anymore. Why have they turned away in, in countries like this, in countries like Ireland, in parts of Europe? And I think in recent times, uh, the abuse crisis turned people off. The treatment of women has turned people off. I can think of innumerable women who walked away from from uh, the faith in which they were they were raised. And over and over again, it it's about power and it's about the abuse of power. And, and people find that problematic and feel that the church as an institution is distant from themselves. But having said that, I think Catholics also like clarity and like authority to a certain extent. And so while we want to see power not so abused as it has been i think people don't want to, to feel that the catholic church is going to become a bit kind of fuzzy that encounter and collaboration are great but i think people still want clarity and i don't know if i ought to say this but i think a lot of catholics don't want the catholic church to become uh anglicanism and uh, and and you know we've seen what synods are like in the Church of England. It is important to remember that the, the synod is not a deliberative body in the Catholic Church. So the, the what the synod agrees upon and votes upon is then submitted to the Pope, who has the deliberative voice and the deliberative vote. So it's not like the Church of England synod in that sense, and that is a key distinction. So. Although the Pope has given more power to the Synod, more authority to the Synod, um, the Synod is, is effectively a consultative body. It's not a deliberative body. I think it's fair to describe in journalistic shorthand Cardinal Vincent Nichols as the leader of the Catholic Church in England and Wales. But he has his own diocese, which is Westminster. And he put out a pastoral letter about the Synod in which he said about the Synod, how can we be a church of encounter and dialogue which seeks to hold together, often in tension, fidelity to the truth expressed in her teaching and the compassionate love for every person. Now, I think there's a massive issue for the church there. If fidelity to the truth expressed in the Catholic Church's teaching um, you know, can be in tension with compassionate love for every person. And I think the synod's got to find a way through that. Thank you very much. Now, I am just going to um, come back to one, well, raise one issue, though. I mean, um, Anna, you mentioned the issue of um, sexual abuse. Um, Catherine mentioned the abuse of power. And, uh, and it's obviously a very big um, shadow over the Catholic Church, that of sexual abuse. But there's also a shadow over the Pope himself just at the moment. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I think that, Christopher, you ought to just tell us what's been happening, uh, the controversy around uh, Marco Rubnik, who has been expelled by the Jesuits for um, alleged um, um, abuse, um, and who the Pope himself is accused of um, defending or certainly not listening to um, the voices of the sisters. Marco Rupnik is a ex-Jesuit, still a priest, um, and a prominent artist, um, very, very prominent artist, church artist, mosaicist, um, accused of abuse 
of religious sisters over a 30 year period. Um, he was removed or expelled by the Jesuits. Um, but recently, uh, the Diocese of Rome, uh, which is the Pope's diocese, um, uh, did an investigation into the centre that Rupnik set up uh, and effectively said that everything was well at the centre uh, and that, um, you know, called into question a disciplinary measure that was brought against Rupnik. He was excommunicated briefly um, for uh, absolving uh, a woman or a sister who he had engaged with sexually. So a very serious offence and made that the, 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 the report from the Diocese of Rome effectively seemed to try to rehabilitate Rupnik, which obviously, understandably, victims are very, very upset and have come out saying the Diocese of Rome has ridiculed their pain. And how damaging is that? What it shows is that in Rome, there's a ma major problem when it comes to the handling of abuse. There is not an independent office to deal with these issues. So you have, in the case of Rupnik, he's a Jesuit. Okay, so he's he's got the Jesuit order who are responsible for him. There's also the Vatican's Dicastery for the Doctrine of Faith, which deals with allegations. You've also got the Pontifical Commission for the Safeguarding of Minors. You've also got um, the, the Diocese of Rome. All these different entities, it's a mess. So there needs to be one office investigating the case, getting clarity, dealing with the problem, making the recommendations uh, and uh, responding. Now, it, 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 there are big questions over, the, over you know, what has happened here. And the Pope has in the past said, um, you know, he, he's, not, he's denied intervening improperly in this case. Um, but, you know, this, this also hits at the, the big issue for the Synod, which is transparency and accountability. Um, Thank you. It's a great example of the need for that. I was interested in the degree to which the Synod is also the focus of hostility to Francis and his entire agenda, um, which I wonder if it's going to deal with. I mean, we have uh, the man leading the polls in the Pope's native Argentina who denounces him as a force for evil, literally. We have the movement of the general, what used to be called the alt-right, but is now rather bigger than the non-alternative right. Um, there was, in Italy, we have the My Pope is Benedict movement, or had, um, and his policies on immigration are enormously contentious in large parts of, of, of Europe. And to what extent is the Synod taking place in a bubble and completely ignoring what seems to be the most interesting political development in the Catholic Church at the moment? So I think that there is a very noisy, well represented in public in a certain kind of particularly social media context where the Francis, the anti Francis and anti Synod agenda comes together. I actually don't think that it's a bad thing that the focus of the Synod is largely not on those questions about propping up, um, you know, Francis or uh, any notion that the role of the Synod is to defend Francis's position. The role of the Synod is to conduct its own process as much as possible, quietening what is very often a very unhelpful and skewed conversation. We were talking earlier about the fact that this was meant to be a mass consultation, the largest listening process in history, as Chris said. And the reality is that it's those in the middle who didn't really take part as much as they might have done, who were the ordinary Catholics in the pews. Those are the people that we need to engage. Those are the people that we need to draw along. And they need to be drawn along as the journey goes. That conversation about anti-Synod, anti-Francis is politically very significant, but it is largely a political and well-funded movement which has its very own ecclesiological, social and political agenda to it. Now, those people should be distinguished from those who have concerns about the Synod or who don't feel well represented themselves, including certain conservative voices. I'm much more sympathetic to thinking about how those voices need to be engaged. But those political questions, I don't think they belong on the Synod hall floor. Um, they do belong in the wider synod process, but I don't think they belong on the floor of the assembly. And um, Chris and, and, and Catherine may have other things to say on that, but can I just say one thing on Rutley? Mm. 
and abuse. Um, if Francis has been involved in any way, that's a really serious and major issue. And the danger is that will overshadow at least the next week or so. So it's important that you raise it now and it is significant. But what the Synod is trying to deal with is the deep, difficult culture issues of the Catholic Church right now. And the reality is that figures like Rupnik and a series of other individuals who we found were in major significant roles and very involved in, in abuse were raised up in the era of a different papacy where there was a culture of supporting these charismatic individuals in ways that have turned out to be deeply problematic. So this is not just an issue that belongs on the desk of Francis. How Francis deals with it is critical and in no way would I wish to, to dilute that question. But if we're really going to deal with a culture of abuse in the Catholic Church, we've got to deal with the last few decades and the way in which we raised up particular characters in ways that really have turned out to be deeply problematic. So I would hope that we can think about this in terms of how do we deal with who we are and where we are and the reality of what allowed abuse to become such a significant and problematic issue in the church. And that's not just about Francis. Well, I, I think the opposition is a factor. It cannot be ignored. Um, and I saw at the Amazon Synod in 2019, um, yeah. the effect that, that had in terms of the understanding of what was going on in the Amazon Synod, which was supposed to be about the Amazon region and the needs of the church there, etc. So the, the opposition is, is powerful and, as Anna says, well-funded. Um, the danger for the Amazon Synod, uh, sorry, for the opposition and the Synod, is that you kind of poison the well for everyone else watching it and engaging with it. And there is, I think there is maybe not significant um, outspoken opposition to the Synod. I think that's still a, a minority. There are plenty of skeptics and people who are unsure. So the power that the opposition has um, can have a, an outsized impact. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't underestimate uh, what might be attempted to try and derail the Synod. Um, and I think there's opposition not just from the, the far right, but there's also coming from uh, other more progressive voices who said that this is not even worth engaging with. That's also opposition to a, to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the, the opposition from the right, which is well funded, does have the potential to poison the well for the rest of the church. And that's why it does have to be addressed. Thank you. I mean, Anna, of, of the delegates that are um, attending, I mean, they're, they're, they're sort of handpicked. So presumably they're, they're, they're not the vocal critics um, um, in the Synod. It's, um, you know, ev everyone's on, on side, are they? No, absolutely not. So okay. uh, what's really interesting is that there is a massive range of perspective on the issues on the table, as it were, and also of ecclesial disposition towards the Synod in that room. There are people who've been openly critical of the Synod, who will be participating, and there are people with every different range of um, sort of church background uh, there. So I, I don't believe for one minute that everybody is on board. Um, I think that there's a real, real range in that room. And in fact, one of the most interesting things will be, and, it will, and this is where, you know, we can talk about what we expect or what we hope for, but it's the unknown things. It's the things that will emerge by bringing the people together in that room, in that way. We, It is the unknown that will be the most interesting thing um, and, and to watch out for uh, and really think about because... Uh, the fault lines of the of the Catholic Church are all there present in that in that ecclesial assembly. Just following on from what Anna has said, what's really vital is to have a feel for what is the atmosphere and the ethos that has been that Francis and the Secretariat have been trying to set up for this assembly, um, which is one of is pr a prayerful, reflective pondering. And why I think that's important is because that seems to be the criteria that is necessary for mature discernment. And <clears throat> back on the Amazonian Synod that Christopher raised the point about, Pope Francis said there wasn't that maturity present within the body to be enable a discernment. Mm. I think that, that's, that having a feel for that is important, but also his passionate sense that the Holy Spirit will be at work there. So that's quite a strong thing for him to have said, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm not sure if my hand was raised in respect to wanting a uh, traditional voice, but it was raised in terms of a kind of Catholic grassroots point of view. So the Catholic Union, who I work for, is a membership organisation. Uh, we have members across England, Wales and Scotland. We hosted a webinar earlier this year with some of the fine uh, people on this on this call. Um, I'd make two points, really. I think one is around the way in which this synod has been communicated. Um, I think whatever your views on it are, and it has undoubtedly uh, deepened fears and heightened hopes, um, is the way in which it's been communicated in terms of, um, you know, what people can expect from this, you know, what it is and what it is not. And I think it, we can't expect the world to know what the church is doing if we, you know, ourselves haven't communicated it effectively to our own people. And I think the fact that it's gone on another year in some ways is regrettable because that then just allows another year of expectations and fears to drift. So I think um, better communication... Are you saying it has been... You're right. So you're saying that it's not been communicated as well as it might have done? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, just judging from the range of comments we've seen. And, you know, and that, that's also some mayor culprit on our part. You know, I mean, there was a Catholic publication at the end of last year that ran a headline, Is This Vatican Three? which, you know, for the reasons that various people have set out, uh, is clearly not the case. So um, I think, you know, internally within the church, we haven't perhaps been the best advocates for the synod. Um, but I would make another point, which is around formation. And I think this process has exposed uh, a sort of gap in the knowledge, if you like, in terms of how the church is run and how decisions are made. Um, I mean, I expect that the Anglican church, you know, for all of its uh, faults and challenges, I suspect there was a better understanding uh, amongst average Anglicans in terms of mm. how the church is run and how decisions are made as opposed to Catholics. And so I think coming out of this, you know, if, if there is one thing coming out of this, it should be a better need for formation of Catholics in how their church, the church of which they are part, is run and managed. And hopefully with that knowledge, will come an increased appetite to, to get involved. So if there is one good thing that hopefully unites the church, it is the need for a better understanding of, of how the church is run and, and governed. Thank you. Um, Sister Jill has uh, put in the um, chat box to me that formation was a critical point raised by all parts of the church in the world. And Christopher Lamb at the same time said formation is a key part of the working document. So um, thank you very much for that, James. Um, Martin Pendergast, you want to come in again? I just wanted to uh, comment on the um, this this pos position that's been expressed about um, oh it's it's um, it's not the ordinary people in the pew um, that have been involved in this process. My own local parish experience uh, is that uh, we've we conducted our listening process uh, uh, over two occasions, two Sundays in the middle of mass. Instead of the homily, we had a listening process where members of the congregation spoke and listened to each other about the the, the various questions that the, the synod was raising. And that formed our submission into our Westminster Diocese uh, report. Uh, and we did a similar exercise. We've done two similar exercises and including another one online, which was a bit more international in focus uh, with um, LGBT <clears throat> Catholics Westminster. So I really challenge uh, the point that um, that this is just a group of activists. And, and through this process, certainly in the LGBT Catholic community, we're attracting new people. We're attracting people who are seeking baptism, who are seeking reception into the church, who are seeking confirmation because the church has walked away from them 25, 30, 40 years ago. Um, uh, these are the people who are yearning for a place in the church. Thank you very much indeed. Um, you do say as well in the chat box, what's of more concern is not the opposition, but the cynicism that many of us have been here before, whether at the Second Vatican Council or the Liverpool 1980 National Pastoral Congress. Mm. So um, that expresses your concern that um, 
maybe the synod won't won't deliver for you. Yeah, can, can I just come back on that and say that certainly at the Liverpool National Pastoral Congress, a good number of the questions that have come up in the recent synodal process and consultations were raised there back in 1980. Uh, it, questions of the ordination of women, uh, the ministry of women, the admission of divorced and remarried Catholics, a greater sense of church unity, uh, and also uh, a review of the church's position relating to LGBT Catholics. Just hearing people talking about the, the opposition to Pope Francis, and alongside the opposition to Pope Francis are a lot of people who uh, absolutely adore him, who are huge fans of his and think he can do absolutely no wrong. So in, in that sense, you could say that he's a rather divisive figure. Uh, and popes used to be viewed, you know, they, their title was pontifex, the bridge builder, the, the, the person who would bring Catholics together and that you'd all um, be loyal to the pope, come what may. Uh, and I think mu much of, of this issue with the divisions over Francis is, is, is probably down to social media. That's the era we live in. But I think it, it does raise the issue of what kind of person should be the next Pope. And Francis is 87. We don't know if he'll abdicate like Benedict did or whether he'll keep going to the very end. But the very end, he's 87, can't be that far off. So I think in the, the, when it comes to thoughts about what kind of Pope we'll have next after Francis, I think those who vote need to think about do they want somebody who's such a Marmite figure or are, are all popes going to be Marmite figures in the social media age? And therefore, how do they deal with that? I wonder if there'll be any sort of um, jockeying or positioning or um, not electioneering for um, for um, the position of the next pontiff at, the, uh, at this synod. The Pope will be 87 in December. And so obviously um, the, this, this synod will have uh, a, a pre-conclave feel to it, without doubt. Um, uh, the, you know, Francis can't can't go on forever. Um, so yeah, I think that's going to be part of the the dynamic. I mean, I, I think if if you were to poll Catholics, I think majority of Catholics uh, would be, I think, supportive of Francis. Um, I also think Christians outside of the Catholic Church would also be supportive of Francis. So I think I I don't. I mean, I know he can, Francis does split people, but I think it's more of a small group who are very, very upset rather than the 50-50. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, Anna? Yeah, just to come back on the point that Martin was making a minute ago, which I think is is really important, which is we're in a position where so much of what has emerged and is on the table for the synod conversation are things that in reality have already come up many times before. There are very few things that are genuinely new or novel. There's all sorts of novel things about the process that Chris was highlighting at the beginning, but the actual content is not really very novel. So that implies that there are real issues with the reception of previous synods and the materials that they've produced the reception of previous teaching, the efficaciousness, the effectiveness of various formation programs, which is, uh, you know, the formation point is critical. So what's happening that means that the teaching and the discussions that we have had have not dealt with a whole series of issues which remain on the table? And you can have the big headlines about the potential doctrinal changes, but what's really interesting is the recurrence of the same questions and challenges that face us as Catholics. And what difference will this synod make? Right. Handle those? Lovely. So I'm going to do something very cruel to all of you six is I'm going to ask you for a headline you know a journalist headline short what do you think is going to be the headline that will come out of the synod I'm going to start with Christopher and Catherine because they're journalists and they should be able to do it quickly and then I'm going to come to um, the, the other four of my guests so um, Catherine you first well, I can't predict how it will go, but I think something I put on a, a, a feature and sort of right at the beginning of the cinema will be women in the church, the great debate. Uh, Christopher, headline coming out of the synod, if you can. Um, yeah, something similar, I think. Um, synod opens door to women deacons, question mm. mark. Um, 
Uh, Miriam, what 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 do you say to that? What was your what would your headline be? Yeah, your very headline. similar. Women can no longer be silenced. Uh, Martin, LGBT Catholics fully valued and respected. Sister Jill, spirit informed, outward facing church. The headline will be something we don't yet know and cannot anticipate. Oh, that's ducking. That's ducking the question. <laughs> that, that's your headline for the beginning. That, yeah, that's your headline for the beginning. Well, look, thank you all very much indeed. I hope that was um, useful and informative. I certainly learned a lot and enjoyed the discussion very much. I imagine we might want to have another briefing in a month's time and uh, discuss uh, whether we were right in our headlines and uh, what we've made of it all. But thank you all very much indeed for joining me and um, see you again soon.